In this part we want to talk about planarity, we want to talk about planar graphs and how we can test whether a graph is planar. So what is a planar graph? We say that a graph is planar if we can draw it in such a way that no edges cross each other. So this is just for a node link drawing where the vertices are points and the edges are curves. So for this example, is this a planar graph? Yes it is, because we can take this edge and reroute it, draw it like this, and now we have a drawing without any crossing. So while this is not a planar drawing, this is a planar graph. A planar drawing of a graph also comes with a so-called embedding. This is a combinatorial embedding. This just tells us, well, how does this drawing look like combinatorially? So. For every vertex, we want to have a clockwise orientation of the adjacent vertices. So let's put some labels here. Now for number one, if I look around the edges, the first edge goes to two, then to three, and then to five. So the clockwise orientation of the adjacent vertices is two, three, five. For number two, we can go to three, then to one, and then to four. So we have the clockwise orientation three, one, four. You see, these are circular. I could also write 1, 4, 3 or 4, 3, 1. For the 3, we have 4, 1, 2. For the 4, we have 5, 3, 2. And for the 5, we have 1, 4. Now, a planar graph can have many different planar embeddings. Here, instead of rerouting this edge, I could have also rerouted that edge. And that gives me a different drawing with a different planar embedding. Because now, if I look at the clockwise orientations, for the 1, we first go to 3, then to 2, then to 5. And for the 2, we go to 3, 4, and 1. So you see, most of these change except the 5. The 5 still is 1, 4. It only has two neighbors, so it will always be the same. This does never change. But all the others, there, the order of the adjacent vertices is switched. So now we have two different embeddings of this planar graph. But a planar embedding can also have many different drawings. We don't have to draw it like this, we can move the vertices around, we can change the curves. Here I even flip this curve to the other side, and it's still this combinatorial embedding. So for every embedding, we can have an infinite number of drawings. And a planar graph can have many different embeddings. Now if we have a planar drawing, then this defines faces. A face is a connected region of the plane that's bounded by the edges. So in this example, this here would be a face. And we get the same face in both drawings of the same combinatorial embedding. We have this face, we have this face, we have this face, and we have this face. Now, there is something that you probably realize that it's slightly different. Because those regions that we have, there is always one unbounded region, which is the so-called outer face. And in these two different drawings of the same combinatorial embedding, the outer face is different. On the left, the green is the outer face, on the right, the purple is the outer face. All the other faces are called inner faces. To make sure that our drawings are as equivalent combinatorially as possible, we usually also specify which of the faces will be the outer face when we specify a planar embedding. But if you look here, the planar embedding is defined by the clockwise orientation of adjacent vertices around a vertex. But if I look at this face here, the orange face, this has a clockwise orientation of incident vertices 1, 2, 4, 5. Here it again has 1, 2, 4, 5. The red has 2, 3, 4, 2, 3, 4. The purple has 1, 3, 2. And here it's also 1, 3, 2. Here we have to go the other direction, because if we look from the outside, from the outer face, then this is our clockwise direction. So for all the interior faces, we just look at it clockwise. And from the outer face, if you want, you can say you look at it counterclockwise. And then we get the same order of the vertices around every face. And for planar graphs, the description of the faces is actually equivalent to the description of the adjacent vertices around every vertex. So instead of writing this, we can also give a description how do the faces look like, which vertices are on the faces and how are they ordered. And that also uniquely gives us a planar embedding and an equivalence class of all these different drawings that are kind of similar. 
we will now go to our first theorem, which is Euler's polyhedra formula. Euler's polyhedra formula for planar graphs tells us the following. The number of faces we have minus the number of edges plus the number of vertices is equal to the number of connected components plus one. Most of the times we have only one connected component and then that tells us faces minus edges plus vertices is two. And we want to prove this now. How do we do this? We do induction on the number of edges. So first prove it is there, if there is no edge at all. Then how many faces do we have and how many connected components do we have? Well, we have exactly one face because there are no edges that can bound any other regions and connected components. Every vertex we have will form its own connected components because no vertices are connected. So here we have one and here we have n. And now if we plug that in here, we have a one, we have a zero, we have an n. So this is n plus one. The c is an n. So this is also n plus one and we're done. Now what happens to larger m? We want to reduce this to a case of a smaller m, so we just pick any edge e and we remove it from our graph. So we assume that we have shown it for all smaller m's and then we know that after we remove the edge the formula holds. There are two cases we have to consider. The first case is that if we remove this edge then this gives us two connected components. So this splits a connected component into two. What happens in this case? So m was reduced by 1, the number of faces stays the same, vertices stays the same, but the number of connected components goes up by 1. So we have one more here, one more here, and the formula still holds. In the second case, if we remove e, we don't split a connected component. But that means that this edge e has to be between two faces and these two faces will be merged, so the number of faces goes down by one. And now we have one less here and one more here, so the left side stays the same and the right side stays the same, and again we're done. And this is already the whole proof. Now with this formula we can show many properties. And this is one of the most important uh, formulas that you have for graph drawing. Whenever we have planar graphs, we always use Euler's polyhedra formula when we want to figure out how many edges we have or how many faces we can have in some specific graph class. So let's assume that we have a simple planar graph with at least three vertices. We want to show three properties. The first one is we have at most three n minus six edges. How can we show that? So let's assume we have a graph here and we have a planar embedding and now we want to count how many edges we have and how many faces we have. So we want to look at a single edge here. This edge lies between two faces, or at most two faces. On the other hand, if I look at a face, how many edges do I have on the boundary of this face? It's always at least three. We always have at least three faces. This gives us a triangle. If we have two, then we would have to have multi-edges between two vertices, which we did not allow because we only have simple graphs. So what does that help us? If I look at every edge and I count every face that's incident to it, and then I look at every face and I count every edge that's incident to it, how many times do I count every face and how many times do I count every edge? Well, if I look at all these faces, then this purple face will be counted at least three times because there are three edges around it. If I look at this edge, this will be counted at most two times because there are at most two faces around it. So if I take three times the number of faces, then this is at most two times the number of edges. And now we can plug this into Euler's polyhedra formula. So we have c plus 1 on the right side. We now just multiply everything by 3 so we get nicer numbers. c plus 1 is at least 2, so this is a 6 here. This is at most 3f minus 3m plus 3n. And now we plug in this formula here. That means that we have at most 2m minus 3m plus 3n. 
So this is at most 3n minus m. So we have 3 times number of vertices minus number of edges is at least 6. And now we just put the m on the other side and we get our formula. We have at most 3n minus 6 edges. And this type of double counting everything, that's something that you use many times. So you often l do this charging argument where you want to charge some objects to other objects. You basically charge every edge to some face and every face to some edge. And then I count how many charges do I move around. And with this double counting, this is similar to the handshaking demo that we had earlier, we can figure out things like number of edges, but also later we will figure out other stuff with it. The second property we want to prove is that we have at most 2n minus 4 faces. Can you prove that yourself? This is very similar to what we had before. We start with this that we already figured out. And for the 2m, we can plug in what we figured out for the number of edges. So we have 3f is at most 6m minus 12, and now we divide by 3 and we're done. That's it already. And the third property, we have some vertex of degree at most 5. How do we prove that? Well, we know the number of edges we have in total is at most 3n minus 6. And from the handshaking lemma, we know if we sum up all the degrees, then we get 2 times the number of edges, so 6n minus 12. So the sum of degrees is at most 6n minus 12. That means that the minimum degree is at most the average degree, and the average degree is less than 6. So there is some vertex that must have degree at most 5.